Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. Well, I am just so excited today. I get to hang out with someone who I think is really, really cool, and that is Rachel Lang. Now, I'm hanging out with Rachel Lang for a couple of reasons. So one is she's going to be teaching at Synchronicity University, the upcoming November 2021 speaker series. She's one of our superstar speakers who's going to be there, and she's going to be talking about timing financial decisions and the great thing is is that until the end of october 2021 you can choose your tuition rate as low as just five dollars a class which is really an unheard of rate to hear someone as incredible as rachel lang she certainly has a lot of respect in the community and is a very accomplished astrologer and you're going to see how much i love her when we have our conversation but the other thing i really wanted to talk to her about is her brand new book, Modern Day Magic. And so the full title is Modern Day Magic, Eight Simple Rules to Realize Your Power and Shape Your Life. And she teaches magic and leads rituals. So she's just magical all around. And I'm so happy to get to hang out with my friend, Rachel Lang. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you for being hey. here. Uh, thank you so much. You are so magical too. So it just, I just feel the synergy and I feel, I feel like we're going to ripple that out into the, into, to anyone who's listening it, into the world. I think so. I mean, look, I just think that you're so magnetic. I know that your book launched recently and I can't tell you, I literally felt so proud of you. I have to say, like, I don't normally go around like actively emailing people and say, Hey, I'm so proud of you. Well, maybe I do. Maybe there are some people out there who say that I do that because I really feel that way. And there are some people like yourself, uh, where it just really feels that much stronger. And so Congratulations on your book. I know it's a number one new release in its category on Amazon. That feels really good, right? Yeah, it does. It feels really good. Yeah. yeah. It, it was such a, a beautiful process writing it too. And uh, and so I think it, it doesn't, I don't feel good from an ego place. I feel good because I feel like I was the, I was the carrier of this information. Like I feel, I feel so, I feel so committed to the messages of the book. And the book is all just about helping people, but women in particular, or anyone who's been in a position where they haven't felt powerful in the world of helping them reclaim their power, helping them to experience the power of magic and therefore their own innate supernatural inherent power. So, so I, I feel like it's time for this message to be out in the world and it's time for more magic to be moving through the world as well. And so can, can you, can I ask just one of the eight simple rules? Cause I know yeah, yeah. there's eight simple rules. <laughs> Give me one of them. I want to see if I'm doing it. That's why. Okay. okay. I, 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 I know you, I know you're, I know you're doing all of them and I, and you, you teach this, you teach this too. So um, the, the one, the one rule that is standing out to me more than anything, in addition to use magical astrology, because magic and astrology go hand in hand. But the other rule I would, I would add is, uh, embrace your dark side and that, so every chapter is a magic rule and it's all basically step-by-step -step process of how to integrate magic into your everyday life. But Embracing your dark side means that you are not afraid of any of your potentiality. And, and, and really, I talk about the dark as being the hidden aspects of ourselves, the subconscious. So not the mean, uh, manipulative part of us, but the shadow parts of us. And, uh, and so that is, um, that's, a re that's like one of my favorite chapters in the book, because I kind of take the idea of dark and light and put it all on its head. I turn it on its head. And, uh, and it's, and it's really, um, it's really powerful what happens for people when they start to integrate and love their whole selves. Wow. That's so powerful. It's true. You know, normally when we think about the shadow, we think about the part of us that we want to deny that we don't want to admit as a part of us, which tends to represent lower attributes. But the truth is the shadow is also the unconscious and there can be a lot of love there as well. Yeah. There can be a lot of power there as well. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing I talk about in that in that book or in that chapter is that there are forces of creation and there are forces that feel good. And we might call them, we might think of them as like Jupiter or Venus, the benefics, 
life-giving, uh, pleasure, pleasurable um, forces. And then there are forces of destruction. And so everything is cyclical, you know, things die and they get, and other things get born. And so forces of, of destruction aren't necessarily bad, but they don't always feel good. Like when we have losses or when we go through grief. And so what I aim to do in that book is to, to really get us away from the binary thinking of this is good and this is bad and this is dark and this is light and start to open us up to seeing the world as this complex, rich world uh, place full of contrast and full of different experiences and that everything that dies gets reborn in some other way and that there are beginnings and endings that are happening in all ways. And when we start seeing the world through the eyes of magic, then we start seeing ourselves as, as in this wondrous, amazing relationship with all forces of nature and with one another. And I think that is kind of where we're all moving as we look to Pluto moving into Aquarius in a couple of years, as we're moving further and further closer to the Aquarian age and moving into some of those Aquarian ideals. Um, I think that we're going to start really reconstructing our ideas of, 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 of how we've, how we've been in the world and, 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 you know, what, what our beliefs are. That is so powerful. I love how you made that connection because I think about how, and uh, to me, right, just, this is my, I know it's a very hotly debated topic as to the Aquarian age and when that's yes, going to begin. Yes, yes. I mean, totally. if you really want to get astrologers very excited and very <laughs> <Yeah>. lively, right? <laughs> and that's saying it nicely. <laughs> See no, what people think about. The equinoxes. <laughs> know, exactly, yes. right? But what's interesting is that these qualities that you talked about on the one hand, that more judge, judgmental, puritanical stuff, in many ways, it does speak to the age of Pisces, doesn't it? Yeah, and now yeah. we're moving into this age of Aquarius where more and more can be seen in, in a way that is with a healthy detachment at its very best. I mean, every age has its light and its dark, or I should say its shadow and its uh, parts of it that we're aware of. But mm -hmm. it should be really interesting. And I love how you made that connection that uh, normally we think of the age of Pisces, and I know I've conceptualized it as a time of, of you know, everyone's a prophet, everyone's a messenger type of thing. And now going into a place where the energy is going to become a lot more scientific, a lot more detached, a lot more niche. But there are other ways to understand this as well, because a lot of the religiosity of the age of Pisces can also be very judgmental. Exactly. Just like we see in spiritual traditions, like I'm very much of the belief that whoever you are, that's what you're going to find when you go to any spiritual tradition. So yes. if you're a person with a lot of unconscious wounds and you're not ready to own them, um, that's what you're going to see when you read any given sacred text. But if you're mm -hmm. a person who desires love and wants the peace of, of uh, universal or divine love, then that's what you're going to find as well. Mm -hmm. The language can be so powerful, but the fact that you connected that with the age of Pisces, the judgmental, that is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think, can you describe a little bit more about what you think of the age of Aquarius, what some key characteristics might be? Sure, sure. Well, I think we're seeing little ripples of it now. And ever since, you know, we had the great conjunction in uh, with Saturn and Jupiter, both entering Aquarius I think they're really setting the tone for what's going to happen when Pluto enters Aquarius in 2023 and 2024. And what we saw throughout this last year, almost, or I guess not even quite a year yet, almost a year. But what we've seen is we've seen individuals expressing themselves, trying, express, expressing themselves as a part of the whole. And we've seen a lot more emphasis on um on individual uh sorry my my siri sometimes spirit sometimes talks through siri hello <laughs> yes spirit through siri hello siri yes. how are you yeah hello um i wish we could name siri whatever we want like, right. i wish we didn't just have to call it siri like we could <laughs> yes. have something else yeah we could call her elizabeth if we wanted but well, that's good. apple that's hasn't good. figured that out yet but okay no they have not um, but back to the idea of Aquarius, I, I really do think, so I, when I think about every sign, I think about it in terms of its axis line, because wherever, you know, because the opposite point, the polarity is, is always within each sign. 
And so I think what we have is we have the Leo qualities, which is Aquarius's opposite of self-expression, of creativity. And I mean, think about how TikTok has blown up, you know? And so we have these people who might have been too afraid to be on YouTube because that feels too, too much. We have now all, like every person finding a way to express themselves. And in doing so, they're connecting through hashtags, through groups, through online communities to a whole. So I think that's one of the themes that we'll see with the age of Aquarius. Or, um, again, I'm not going to get into the, I don't want to any other astrologers, you know, kind of, but, but with these Aquarian ideals, I think the other thing we're seeing is a real contrast because Aquarius is also independence. It's the free spirited, don't tell me what to do, rebel instinct. And so I think we're going to have this real tension between individual rights and individual freedoms and the common good because within Aquarius is that concept of oneness and that's the symbol for the water bearer it's it's uh each one of us as drops of individuals coming together to form one body one human human collective or one collective I think if we consider the earth and creation too so I think we have this contrast of humanitarian ideals communities forming and people coming together and balancing that with how do we expect express ourselves feel free within this new paradigm within this new context context that we're living wow i love uh some of those correlations that you made i completely agree that we are going to see this tension between individuality and the collective and i love how you expressed that i don't know um how we reconcile. I mean, I think about how we're coming out of the age of Pisces and even the age of Pisces had a very strong duality to it as well. And now we're entering a time that continues the duality. But like I think about in pop culture, right? The age of Aquarius was like uh, promoted as this time of unity. What do you think that's about? Why do you think that Aquarius got this rep for being about unity? But we know as astrologers that it's actually a sign with a very strong duality to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the sign of dictatorship. I mean, it's I mean, it's, it's a sign of like power too. Um, but I think I, I mean I think we can thank the musical hair for some yes, of the conduct, you know, and <laughs> some of the uh, movements of you know psychedelics that were happening back in the in the sixties and and really like any time someone experiences the mystical aspect of, of the self. Um, and I don't have a lot of experience with psychedelics, so I don't really know, but I, I mean, I know <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth, <laughs> <That's all. laughs> exactly. uh -huh. but, but I, what I do know is that from documentaries and from also my own research is that those experiences of psychedelics really open up similar path pathways in the consciousness that relate to going into a mystical experience of oneness. And when you go into deep meditative states or when you're in a creative zone, when you're you know, in a, a high vibration place, you can access those same points. And so I think, I think that ultimately that's where we're, you know, where we're going to start moving is, um, is experiencing our oneness and, and going back to in the sixties, you know, hair, hair the, mu the musical hair and, all of these, these you know, movements that involved psychedelics brought people into a sense of oneness. And so that was associated with the Aquarian age. Um, but also that's, I think, also the tail end of the Piscean age too. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the psychedelic, like the going into psychedelic experiences and, and altered states of consciousness. So what, what do you think about Jupiter and Neptune meeting up next year. In oh boy. <laughs> Look, I think that that is an energy of extremes. I think it could go either way, right? Um, and it may just show up in terms of a variety of ways. Like on the one hand, that could be a cure, right? That could be cure, but that could also be um, a heightened pervasiveness of uh, because, you know, the energy of Neptune and, and Pisces, all of that is very much 
associated with viruses as well. Yeah. Um, that can be heightened uh, artistic, like divinely inspired artistic achievement, especially in film or in photography, wherever you're dealing with an illusion. Uh, but it can also be um, the ways in which these technologies can be used to shift consciousness. And it's, you know, isn't it the age of Pisces going out on a high note, right? Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I love that. And I love, I love, I just want to encapsulate what you said about it could be the disease, but it could be the cure. Like that this is, because I think we saw a little snapshot of that when Jupiter entered Pisces uh, with, um, with uh, suddenly the masks were coming off. We were being vaccinated and, you know, vaccines were, were back. And then as soon as it went back into Aquarius, the day after the Delta variant became rampant and, and in California anyway, we were back to wearing masks. So, so it's I amazing. think- amazing. It was to the day. It to was day. to the day. I remember yeah. like Jupiter, I got an alert on my phone because I have it set up that way where I get these little alerts whenever there's a celestial transit. And I saw Jupiter and Pisces. And then a little bit later, I got another alert. CDC says, if you're vaccinated, you don't need a mask. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny how it works out that way sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I love it. I tell my students all the time, like, you know, astrology imitates life. Like, it's, you know, anytime it's like a astrology is real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's so remarkable. And yes, you're so right. Like, and then we had Jupiter go back into Aquarius. And even though Jupiter itself does suggest healing and expansion, and you'd think on the surface that that would bring us together. But the fact that Saturn is in uh, Aquarius and Saturn is that restricting principle, it's almost as if Jupiter is expanding that Saturnian restrictive principle in the collective. That's a really, yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Um, and to where, and, and you know, also Jupiter's in Saturn's sign by traditional rulership. So we have, we have the planet of joy and expansion in a sign that's ruled traditionally by this by the rule maker, you know, <laughs> the planetary, I like to call Saturn the planetary law enforcer. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, and so, you know, but when Jupiter enters Pisces, traditionally, that's the sign it rule, one of the signs it rules. And so, and so we have Jupiter in its joyful state. Um, so I think, but I think that what's happening, and this is going back to that thought of the, you know, what does the Aquarian age look like? I think what's happening is Jupiter and Saturn are helping us to structure a path toward some of that, I, 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 like going deeper into the Aquarian ideals, um, helping us to, to create more, I mean, regulations, because we have some of these tech companies now, the spotlights on them and, you know, the ways they've misused in our information. And so, so I think that there's a, a real, like, putting, putting, putting the, our connect, our systems of connect, our technological systems of connectivity, putting some parameters and guidelines around those so that they're safer and so that they're more effective. And so they really are more in alignment with those Aquarian ideals. Well, let's hope so. I know that Saturn um, can suggest that restriction or the desire to restrict, but then Pluto comes along and Pluto can just um, really bring out the dark side. I hate to say it, right? But it it is very possible um, that we may just see how powerful these companies can get. And, you know, they say that creativity is the next, um, you know, like gold rush, the way that oil was considered liquid gold. It is going to be technology and ideas that I think are the future gold, but it's like a gold that's an idea. It's air. It's not like something that is actually of the earth. And so it'll be interesting to see how these ideas and these technologies, like what is it going to bring out in people? That's the thing. And of course, we have our own intention. Our intention can transform anything. I truly believe that the intention we bring can transform right. anything. But it's, uh, you know, it's a tricky thing. And I think we as astrologers were meant to help people become more conscious of these energies as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, yes. And so thinking about taking your idea about intention. So I think all of it's one thing for all of us to have our own intentions, 
but I think it's another thing for us to create communities. So again, thinking about that Aquarian concept, but to create communities where we're holding collective intentions. Because I think one of the things, another thing with Pluto's entrance into Aquarius in a couple of years, another thing that we're going to see is that, um, again, that, that, that the, the good of one is not going to be, like we're going to move away from the good of one being the good to the good of all, to where if we're not creating sustainable businesses and, and communities, and if, if we're not, if we're not keeping in mind the bigger picture of the environment of one another, and we're not caring about those things, then, then anything that's built on an old system of, you know, capitalist ideology, that, that it's just not going to, it's not going to last in this new paradigm. So we all need to have collective intentions. And this is where magic, magic, I think, is the spiritual revolution that we need right now. And that's happening right now so that we can really create the world that we want um, or that, that, you know, that we gather together and envision together. What could we create? You know, how could we use this creative currency, as you just talked about, to uh, to shape a world that's more equitable, where people aren't suffering, where there isn't, you know, a pandemic that's raging because we're taking care of one another and we're prioritizing healthcare. And I think that's the hope I see for the next few years. Wow. I love that you tied in uh, magic into it, right? And especially because you are a magical teacher. Like you're a magical teacher, but then you're a teacher of magic as well. But I love that you tied that in because, yeah, just as I was, uh, just as I was listening to you, I was thinking, of course, you have this conscious understanding of what it means to direct energies because you do it in a way that has an element of ritual to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're good. You're so good. you're right. Absolutely, I do. I, I love. I mean, I love it. But I've been, I've been doing. I mean, I've been working with magic. In, I mean, when I first started learning astrology, I was taking classes at a spiritualist church. And this was like, we were in this little tucked away basement because it was the nineties. And so, you know, oh, well, like, it's the 90s. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody was like, we had to like hide in secret, you know, yeah. um, or be, we, we did just because they're, you know, there, it was really kind of against taboo. The Taboo. Yeah, it was like an eighth house taboo thing. It wasn't like mm-hmm. now it's so like, what house would you think? Or what, what do you think now of magic? It's so pop culture now. It's almost become 11th house. In I a was way. just going to say 11th yeah. house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but back then it was very eighth house. Absolutely. Very, very eighth house. Yes. When did you start? When did you start learning? Well, I started learning. I mean, I remember in the nineties as well, but I remember even yeah, it must have been the 90s. I don't want to date myself too much. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I remember at 14 being given astrology books by my family. But then it was like sort of my late teens that I really started hanging out at the New Age bookshop and more actively seeking the information. Um, but then it was like, I remember in the 90s reading uh, a lot of books and, and taking classes, mm. especially in the early 2000s. I yes. remember taking a magic classes and things like that in group settings. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was about that. That when I in 2000, in 2000, 1999 was when I took my uh, when I, I would I had been taking little classes here and there and reading books and going to metaphysical bookstores but 1999 was when I was like oh this is my thing um you know and then but you know at that time who would have thought this could have been a career uh, you know it was definitely just something you did for fun but yeah now it's it, things have changed and I I think I think it's because this is a wave this is where we're moving this is a wave of the future and one thing that I um have had just recently I'm, I'm speaking about is you know I did I did some research on the last time Neptune and and Ju- and Neptune and Jupiter met up in Pisces, and it was in the 1800s, and um, and it was a time when there was a rise of the spiritualist movement, and so then I went back and tracked all the other times in the past where this has happened, and what's interesting is that um, every single time the two have come together 
there has been there have been two movements and one one movement toward magic so and even in the 1500s when this when when there was a when there was that that conjunction and i think it was 15 20, i'm really bad with remembering specific dates but it was like 15, i know me too. i go around the 15s <laughs> right yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. exactly but the early um, 1500s let's just say <laughs> right 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 okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's um it there was a there was a rise toward uh witchcraft and earth centered religions and then right after that was like the height of the witch trials which i did my master's research on and um, and then in the 1800s was the rise of the spiritualist movement, and it coincided with the abolition movement. So a lot of Christians who and Quakers who who were fed up with the ways in which Christianity ha, was supporting slavery and anti women's rights, a lot of free thinkers, Quakers, suffragettes started practicing spiritualism, which was associated with magic and associated with witchcraft. And this was right, this started right at the time of the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces. And that led to a whole occult revival. So there was a movement in spirituality that was, that was related to a movement in social justice. And, and so I think what's happening is that you know, after 2020 and the everything that happened in 2020, so many, so many people started looking at the power systems that are that uh, that have built our that our culture has been built upon, and they started saying there's something else. And one of the first places where anyone who has been marginalized or anyone who has been felt a lack of power can experience power is in their inherent spiritual power, in their magic. And so we're seeing a rise of magic and we're seeing a trend toward astrology. And I think it's part of how we're going to recalibrate the way we see power in the world. Um, and this is something that we could trace back throughout time and see number one, magic has always been considered women's spirituality because of the association with witchcraft and women, women's spiritual practices. And and also magic um, has has been, you know, sort of uh, been linked to indigenous people, people who who have who have traditionally not had as much voice in yeah, this marginalized. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So and the energy of Aquarius is so and as you mentioned, Neptune as well. I love that you pointed out how Neptune is so closely linked to the abolitionist movements uh, around the world and um, how it is that this rise of of representation, the rise of paying attention to these different voices, it a part of it really, I think, is about bringing healing to yeah. those spaces and places as well that maybe we haven't been willing to heal or even look at before. I know here in Canada, uh, recently, all of these unmarked graves were yes. uncovered uh, as part of residential schools. And residential schools were these spaces where, um, where children of Indigenous families who were taken away from their families to be sort of re-educated to have their own culture and language sort of erased from them. And they turned out to be very cruel spaces as well. And now we see with all these unmarked graves, it's helping us as a country face all the violence that was part of these environments as well. But it is also encouraging a lot of us as Canadians to look more honestly at um, the land that we live on and at what cost what it is that we have today, uh, what cost it actually took, and to try where possible to bring some healing, some yeah. healing, some acknowledgement. It's a very powerful thing. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there's this mix, I think, of with Neptune being associated with like the abolitionist movement. But also, Neptune is also tears. It's like baptism. But it's also sadness as well. And maybe sadness and tears are a part of what's going to allow uh, healing to actually take place. And I'm hoping that Jupiter meeting Neptune helps us in that regard, as, as you've been pointing out. Yeah. And and I, I think it could even come in, 
in the form of rains falling. Like I think we could see it in collective. Like if we need to look at any weather events that happen as being part of that healing and part of that clearing and ways that people come together. Um, and I'm not predicting anything right now, by the way. I'm just thinking about it like, yes, I think it could be actual tears, a buildup of empathy for one another. I think that I love I love that framing of it um, because that that is how we heal is that we feel together. Now, you know, Rachel, I could keep talking to you, I'm I sure know. for the next two hours, because I love talking to you because you're fun and you're smart and all of that. But let's make sure to talk about timing financial decisions, because Rachel is going to be part of the November 2021 speaker series at Synchronicity University. And right now, until the end of October, you can choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class. And as you've seen, Rachel is so brilliant. So you can imagine what an incredible deal it is to sign up for that very low rate. But yes, tell us about your class, Timing Financial Decisions. Oh, this is one of my favorite subjects to speak about because, you know, I think when we're making, when we have financial decisions to make, whether it's about investing or quitting my job and starting something else or, or saving or buying a house or anything, that it's really, really important to know our blind spots, you know, to know the transits and the progressions that point to financial well-being and financial success or the times that point to it's probably best to be cautious in this, in this time. Um, and, and I've helped so many of my clients make big financial decisions. And so I've, I've done a lot of, of research going back and looking at hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of charts of people who've won the lottery, people who've invested big and won, people who've gone bankrupt. Um, and, and so I, I can see the signatures that someone needs to pay attention to when they're, ha when they're making financial decisions. So I'm very passionate about the subject because I want, I want people to thrive. And I know that astrology has helped me make some of my biggest financial decisions. And so I'm so, so, uh, first of all, I'm really honored to be one of the, you have, you, you are such, you're in Aquarius, is that right? Are you in Aquarius? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> and it's, you bring together such brilliant people. Um, and I love that about you. I really appreciate that about you. And so I'm really honored to be one of the teachers in this group. I mean, you have April Elliott Kent, you have, oh, you just have Louise Eddington. You've got all, so, so many astrologers that I love and respect. Um, so it's a, it's a really an honor to, to be one of the teachers. And I get to talk about my favorite thing. <laughs> all things astrology are my favorite thing, but I really love talking about financial, um, financial decisions and, and personal finances in relation to astrology. I love it. Uh, so a few things come to mind. Like, first of all, I don't know. I just love telling people how awesome they are. Actually, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that's my Sag moon. Uh -huh. Like if someone's awesome, I love telling them that they're awesome. Like, <laughs> and I, I also really love that I can like, uh, create this. And I think it is very Aquarian. Actually, it was with the pandemic that I uh, came up with the idea of choose your tuition rate. So just to mm -hmm. make the classes really accessible. Mm -hmm. And I love that these really great big dog astrologers like yourself, like quality astrologers, quality teachers being available to more people than ever before. Like, I just love being a part of that too. So there's that part of it, but then just the part of it of feeling like, like, I don't know, like I, I allowed or was part of somebody shining bright. I just love that feeling so much. Like I, I can't even tell you how incredibly rewarding it is. Um, so that, that's one part of it. And then of course, I'm so grateful that incredible teachers like yourself, big dog astrologers like you, uh, agreed to come to my school, which is really exciting too, and exciting for my students. Um, and then you said something else. Yes, I wanted to talk about the timing uh, stuff that you just spoke about because it's so interesting that, there's the magical part of what you do, but then there's also the practical part of what you do. And both are part of um, the lived experience. Like we need to understand our magical energy. We need to understand our own intention and how that creates so much for us. But being able to look at the chart and understand the tendencies, understand not just the transits, but also what some of our lessons may be showing up in very practical ways like money 
right? Money is one of those things that even though I've never been somebody who was like financially motivated and things like that, that it was never my intention. I mean, I've been a full-time astrologer for over 15 years. The first seven years I lived below the poverty line in Canada because I was just so motivated to do something that mattered to me. And, you know, I can say that the sacrifice though extended was really <laughs> worth it <laughs> was uh -huh. worth it because I do have a wonderful life today and I'm able to to provide for my family my parents which is so so very important to me but it's interesting that there are these layers to what you do there's the magical intention behind what you do but then you also shared you know the skills that you have an astrologer that you really understand the symbols but then also you like teaching on things that do have a very practical element like being able to look at your chart and recognize um, what financial transit, because that's part of timing is understanding transits, what transits are going to work for what you want to do and what maybe not as much <laughs> for what it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's because I have a Taurus rising. So I, I can get very air sign. I have a lot of, you know, air. I have a lot of air and water. But I, but I'm also at the end of the day, a tour, that tourist rising kind of takes on the practical tone of things. And it's like, how can, how can you use this, you know, and, and also when I work with clients, I want to give them real step-by-step -step processes for, for working with the information, working with their charts. And, um, and I've seen enough people go through financial ups and downs to where now I know a lot of those red flags you know, if you're for, I'll just throw one out. I don't want to give too much away because I want everybody to take the class. But one example of that is, you know, when we have Jupiter, transiting Jupiter and hard aspect with natal Pluto and a hard aspect is a square or an opposition, then often that person's ideas of what's possible for themselves or what, what's possible for their investments can be inflated. And they have this idea of like, they're invincible. And so I've worked with clients who have really got into some f financial debt or have lost a significant amount of money in the stock market and, and making investments during that transit. It's not that we want astrology to limit us in terms of what we're trying to manifest in our lives. But when we see those transits, then we know if an opportunity comes through that we can exercise a little bit of caution. We can ask more questions, maybe take a deep breath and not jump on something. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then potentially avoid getting into a situation that could be difficult. Um, or likewise, if you have a really great transit, um, like for example, let's say you have transiting Jupiter conjunct natal Venus. This is a, you know, this is a lovely, this can be, depending on what else is happening in your chart, a lovely transit for finances. Um, and so then that might be a, a more optimal time to get into the market or to, uh, to make a financial decision. I love it. I'm so excited about your class. I have uh, coming up in my solar return. If I stay where I'm going to be and where I'm planning to be for my solar return, Neptune and Pallas Athena in my eighth house. <laughs> Wow. I know. And so I'm like, okay, Nadia, watch that energy because Neptune can go either way. But mm -hmm. I like the Palace Athena there because that can be independence and feeling very strong and feeling uh, like you're on the forefront of a lot of things. So I'm really looking forward to your class. And as we were talking, I was thinking about the times that Jupiter has squared my Pluto and boy, it's been interesting. So I'm sure that your class is going to be interesting as well. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Is there anything else you want to say about your class? Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think sign up for it. If it's I mean, <laughs> you, there's really no risk. You pay what you can, and uh, and you'll you will even if you've been a practicing astrologer. I have some really cool takeaways. And if you've ever had that question of, am I going to win the lottery? Um, I have a little section on windfalls as well, which is, um, which I think is a really cool takeaway, um, for, for people just because it's fun. Uh, so, so, and, and, you know, there's, there's, I have examples that I use some really good examples and all a variety of different people from different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. So I think, uh, I think it'll be, I, I, I highly 
I, if it's the class I would want to take if I wasn't teaching it. Well, there you go. That's the best uh, testimony and endorsement that there is. Once again, <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much. I'm so proud of you and all the accomplishments and all the ways in which you are a part of the community and helping the community expand and grow and, and just a leader in the field, a big dog astrologer. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this upcoming speaker series. Truly so grateful for you. Thank you. And likewise, I feel the same, feel the same way. Well, thank you everybody out there for watching. And until we connect again, take care. Bye.